Well, welcome to another edition of MD Insight. My name is Connor Delaney and I chair our Digestive Disease and Surgery Institute at Cleveland Clinic. And it's a huge privilege for me today to be here with Dr. Jeffrey Ponsky. Uh, Jeff is a friend, a colleague, a mentor, a boss when we work together at UH and we've known each other for a long time. And so having him here today to tell us a little bit about himself and his specialty and his interests is really a great privilege. So Jeff, let, let me kick off by saying, you know, how, how did you ever pick surgery? I'm not sure I've ever asked you that over the years. What drew you to surgery? When I was a young boy, I had the opportunity to work in the summers as, as a scrub nurse in surgery at a little hospital in Cleveland called Mount Sinai. And I worked in surgery and I wasn't a very good scrub nurse, but I certainly uh, had uh, a lot of love for the surgical uh, specialty and I got to do a little bit technically and it was just a natural move then to go into surgery uh, after finishing medical school. So you, you were at a really exciting time in surgery, certainly for uh, those of people watching who know about laparoscopy and endoscopy because it was all of that evolution and development of these new fields. But tell us about endoscopy. What was endoscopy like when you were starting? And you've shown me some of your old scopes, which are just fantastic historical pieces. But what, what, what was there when you started? It was so much fun, like it was with laparoscopy, to be an endoscopy in the very beginning, a flexible endoscopy. And so the old scopes were quite stiff and they weren't easily looked through. As a matter of fact, the vision was sometimes a little blurry. And uh, the, the uh, vision had to be looked at through the scope itself with your eye, rather than as evolved in a few years on a TV monitor. But the changes were rapid. And in the beginning, endoscopy was a visual inspection of, what, of the GI tract. And we were quite happy to do that. We couldn't do that before flexible endoscopy. And with that, we could evaluate disease. We could understand it better. But from my perspective as a surgeon, what evolved over a number of years is that we use the endoscope. And my perspective was a little different than the gastroenterologist. We use the endoscope to start to do surgical operations through the endoscope. So the endoscope, like the laparoscope, is not the end all, but the vehicle that gets us to where we need to be so that we can do an intervention, which is now a surgical intervention in many cases. Well, so that's allowed you to redefine a lot of surgical operations over the years. Yes, it has, and it, it keeps evolving, and it, it goes on and grows. You know, you start some young people, and you get them excited, and they, they uh, learn this new technique, and their vision goes far beyond what you trained them to do. And uh, just to use the exceeded your, your teacher, so many of the students that I've trained have gone on to evolve new procedures. And so where we started by taking out polyps, we've gone along now to treating all the organs of the gastrointestinal tract, including the stomach, the colon, the pancreas, the biliary tree. And we're working even in the wall of the bowel, as well as going through the wall of the bowel now to do procedures. So, much as laparoscopy mm -hmm. stole many procedures from open traditional surgery, flexible endoscopy is now taking a large portion of even what was done laparoscopically and doing them endoscopically. Oh, absolutely. Um, between ESD programs, and last week I actually had somebody with a, a chronic leak who was sent along uh, after an ileoanastomosis, and we just used... I never believed that you would have such a thing. It must have been someone else. Not here, somebody else. <laughs> So, but just use a dual knife and we did a four centimeter split up the back of this cavity and, you know, uh, and it just changes, changes the experience for the patient. And totally. it becomes comfortable for us because we understand that the endoscopy and the endoscopic surgery is just another tool. Exactly. That's all it, it is. Complements it complements all the other, the other things thing. We, we can use both. Think back a little bit to PEG. Obviously, PEG is one of the things you're most famous for in the long list. Um, but tell us about some of your thoughts around the beginning. I remember you telling me stories about seeing the light through the abdominal wall and it, it set off a light bulb, so to speak. I worked with a very talented pediatric surgeon, Michael Gowder, and he used to ask me to scope these little babies who oftentimes uh, had a brain uh, death at, at birth and severe uh, psychomotor retardation, and they needed feeding tubes, and we were putting feeding tubes in them. But we'd endoscope them sometimes first to see if they had ulcers or other things. And when the light was off in the room, the stomach was quite bright. And we, Michael would push his finger, and we sort of thought about a way we could pass a needle through the abdominal wall and grab a string, and then 
pull it through. And it seemed so logical at the time. In those babies, it was, the alternative was an open big operation. The mothers were happy to have us try it. If it failed, we could do, do the open operation. So we did the peg first in babies, and it worked very clearly uh, and easily. Uh, it, we later went on to test it in the laboratory and understand it better. I don't think we do things exactly that way today, but it worked out fortunately. Oh, that's that's uh, just amazing. So one of the challenges as we come up with all of these new endoscopic procedures is that we're, we're finding that we have so many different ways of teaching trainees to do a procedure. For us, for rectal cancer now, for example, it can be open or laparoscopic or robot or TATME. And then there's some stuff we can do endoscopically. So it adds this complexity to training in that we're trying to teach people on the same volume to do five different operations and be skilled on it. And not everyone can be at a center where they can concentrate on, um, have a concentration on operation A. You've such experience with education and surgical education. What are some of your thoughts about that? Well, I do think about it a lot. It's my first love is to train people. But what we found is it used to be that you, when you and I were residents, you learned a cadre of operations. And when you finished, you were competent in those operations. It's a moving target now because the new operations are developing all the time and rapidly. And so the attending surgeons need to learn these new operations. And you wonder what opportunity is there for the trainee to learn these while the attending himself is learning these. So we have to develop new ways of training people on the fly using our simulation laboratory, using our animal laboratory, using our, uh, our uh, implant, you know, explanted tissue. We have to have courses in, and then while they're still learning, we have to do new things like telementoring and proctoring so that we can actually help the practicing surgeon become skilled in these new procedures. So we're trying to do all of those things now. Yeah, I think not easy. No, it's not, <laughs> no. But I think all of these complementary educational programs and preceptorship programs, we just need to do it to help people learn these skills. Because what you do at the start of your career is so different to what you do at the end. It, it's never the same. I tell anybody finishing their residency, what you're doing today will bear no resemblance to what you're doing in 20 years. Absolutely. So speaking of the 20 years, maybe a closing question. So where do you see endoscopy 10 or 20 years from now? What are the big things coming down the pike or something that people may not be thinking of? What's going to really change? You know, that's almost like asking me, what do you think of the laparoscope in 20 years? Or what do you think about the Kelly clamp in 20 years? It's a tool. We will take it off the shelf. We will use it to do this procedure. We will do even some open surgery in the future. We will do laparoscopic surgery. The surgery of the future is going to be uh, image-guided surgery. We may not even make an incision even with a laparoscope. We may use focused ultrasound or radio surgery in the future. The uh, endoscope may be used to deliver new therapies and we'll integrate that with all the other things that we have so that the endoscope may have on its a robotic endoscope which will then be programmed to help you do uh, different procedures. I definitely think, and I used to fight against it, but I definitely think that robotics is going to be involved in everything we do with artificial intelligence. Yeah, I think so. Once, once we can evolve this cost value equation. You and I, I have always said that. Yeah. We're, we're the people who hate the cost because we run departments, but the other side of it is I see I'm more sorry. and more done. Yeah. It, I believe that in the future, we will sit next to the robot and take advice from it. It will, it will query us and then do procedures that we ask it to do with great facility uh, better than we can do them now. Oh, that's why we have to stay involved. Have to stay really, involved. Really exciting. Yes. Well, Jeff, I, I'd just like to, on behalf of all of us in the group chatting to you or, or listening, uh, thank you so much for your collegiality, friendship, mentorship, and particularly for today. It's fun to spend a little while talking to you. Absolutely. Thanks, my friend. Thanks, Jeff.